Welcome to the Red Door Church Sermon Podcast. Red Door Church is a church seeking to transform the city of Pretoria by the power of the gospel. We are distinctly mission-minded, community-cultivating, and city-loving. Please enjoy this week's sermon, and don't forget to follow and continue the conversation by sharing with those around you. And they asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And this is the word that Jesus gave them. Thanks, Vic. And so more than just the actual words to be repeated, we see what Jesus gave them was a theological template of how to pray and what to pray. And so please read with me from verse 9. It says, Pray then like this. Dear Dad, our Dad who is above all, who loves us so dearly, You who gave it all to bring us into the family. You who made us all brothers and sisters of one another. You are in charge. You are the one who is in control. Nothing is beyond you, more than you, better than you. God, you are more than we could ever have dreamed or asked for. You who is so different from all other reality. May we continue to enjoy your good and glorious name. May all the people of the earth see how good you are to us. May your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. My translation is slightly different from yours. It is the the amplified version of the prayer. Let me pray for our hearts once again. Father, we do pray for that right now, even as Uli prayed and even as we sang, Holy Spirit, move among us. That's what we need right now. We need hearts that can actually hear the truth, listen to the truth, and respond to the truth. We do believe that your word brings us ultimate truth and nothing is more real than the relationship that you enjoy with yourself, God, and we want to be part of that. So lead us into that, not only knowing this, not only experiencing this, but actually trusting and believing this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The one thing that is radically different at this stage from the Bible and from our experience is to understand when God speaks in kingdom language and that he is king and sovereign over all. We're still used to this democratic idea of the leader exists to serve me, and my interests. And that's not actually how a leader should function. The leader should look at not only his own interests, but the interests of the country or the nation and make choices according to that. Our job, rather, is to trust that the leader does have our best interests at heart. And so this morning, as we come to God, this theocracy, this self-proclaimed king, we do have to realize that we have two options. God is king and he is sovereign and nothing will change that fact, irrespective of whether you believe it or not, God will still be king. However, we can either respond in trust and obedience and believing that God is a king and a good king at that, or we can rebel against his good rule. And so the question that you've got to deal with this morning is, what is your disposition towards this God king, this Jesus, this kingdom of him? What do you believe about it? There's no way that we can be ambivalent about this, that we can decide either to stay passive and not going or or casting a vote or not having a position in this. The Bible and the political sphere that we're in, or even the situation, the dire situation of South Africa, pushes you to have to believe something about God, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. So think about your own life and your own situations right now and the things that are going on around you, the things that are outside of your control and seemingly outside of everyone's control. Think about your own emotions, your heart, the things that you're wrestling with right now and ask yourself the question, do you trust God? And is he trustworthy? This is a great question because it leads into the request that is made by today's prayer as we pray that God's kingdom would come and that his will would be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. And so let's dive in. If you're joining us for the first time, we've gone through the first couple of lines in the Lord's Prayer, and we've discovered three huge theological truths about who God is. This is how Jesus starts the prayer. He says, and he starts it describing the quality of relationship that we can have with God and with Jesus. He says, our Father, thereby inviting all of us that's actually outside of the table, not sitting at the table, to come in and to be family, to be in this qualitative relationship with God. And so that's the first huge theological statement that is made by the prayer, that God is not just a distant king, that he is actually also our father. And if our father, meaning that we are brothers and sisters of one another, and not just of one another, also of Jesus, that is our eldest brother. That's the first statement making, establishing this relationship. And not just establishing it, actually inviting everyone into this relationship. Everyone is invited to pray this prayer. Everyone is invited to respond and love God in this particular way. Secondly, the second theological truth is we've seen God's authority and sovereignty. By the description, he is in heaven. And as we describe and we once again see today, this isn't just a locality description, a geographical description of where God's at. It's more a position of authority. He is above all, and his rule is supreme and sovereign. No one can actually challenge it. This is who he is. God is great. And then last week we saw, or we've seen God's glory. That because he is supreme, because he is this awesome magnificent God, his name is to be hallowed. His name is to be given glory and by everyone, especially revered most of all by us, his disciples and his children. And so these three theological truths form the pillar, not just of the Lord's prayer, but also should form the pillars of how we approach God. And what we ask of God and how we interpret the world around us. And so every time we're faced with the situation, every time we want to go and pleading with God, this prayer invites us to once again establish the relationship. Who is God to you? Secondly, what do you believe? Who is God in control? And thirdly, do you believe that he is the one that is supposed to be getting the glory in all of this? And it's out of those three theological truths, if that form is the bedrock of our hearts and of our prayer lives, that we then go in making requests to God about our reality now. It's only through that lens that we can now interpret our reality and the situations that we are faced with around us. And so today we move over and we see the request made about what we wish to see happen in our world, in our situation, after we've proclaimed who and what God is, we can make our desires known to God. And the first one is that we have this desire for the rule and kingship of God to be executed, specifically that the kingdom of God would come. However, It's important to note right at the beginning here that there's actually a difference between the kingship of God, God's rule, and the kingdom of God. When we talk about God's rule or him being king or his kingship, it's similar to saying that God is in heaven. It is a matter-of-fact statement. It tells us that God is ruler and he is supreme irrespective of what our response would be to his rule. As you got up this morning, God was king of this earth, and when you go to bed, God will still be king. Uh, He's been king since the dawn of time, and he will be king when this earth ends. God's rule is unquestionable. It's by his will that everything exists. It's by his will that everything keeps existing. This, his rule spreads everywhere. It's not just limited to God's people. He rules everything and everyone. Even the evil one is subject to him. Nothing falls out of the scope of God's rule and sovereignty. However, when we talk about God's kingdom, it's something quite different, especially when the Bible refers to the kingdom of God. And we see that this is referred to both in the Old and the New Testament. And similar 
to God in heaven, the kingdom of God is so much more than just the locality of where this kingdom is or the geography of this kingdom. When we say your kingdom come, it is something quite different. Often we talk about this with one another and we actually had conversations right before the service that we want people to be kingdom-minded, we want organizations and churches to be kingdom-minded to see God's kingdom come. But what does that actually mean? What does it mean that God's kingdom should come? Well, if, if it's then not just a place, but a sphere, or what are we referring to when we talk about God's kingdom? Because we know that His rule is supreme, and nothing escapes that. Well, we're introduced again to the idea of what God's kingdom is as Jesus starts his ministry. So I'm going to read for us Mark 1, verses 14 and 15. It says that after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Another translation of this says that the kingdom of God is near, physically near to them right now. And so what is Jesus talking about? We, we see that somehow this kingdom of God that is at hand, that is near, is somehow caught up with the person of Jesus Christ. We see that God's kingdom is therefore much lesser idea of where it is, about locality and more about a relationship that Jesus is calling people to. Specifically, our relationship with God through Jesus. This is just the introduction of that idea of what kingdom is. Jesus returns later to this idea as well in John 3, when one of the leaders, one of the Pharisees, actually comes to Jesus and asks him about this message that Jesus is preaching about this kingdom of God and what that means and how actually one then gets close to God. And he says the following, John 3, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs, unless you, uh, signs that you do unless God is with them. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And here we start understanding what God is inviting us to and what God is inviting us in. Even though his rule is supreme, we do see that not everyone is yet part of the kingdom of God. And as the kingdom of God draws nearer, what happens is that some are invited to enter into the kingdom of God. And the way that you enter into this kingdom of God is not just by some weird form of allegiance of trying to do the right thing. Rather, what Jesus says, the only way that you can actually be part of this kingdom and not just be under the rule of God, but be under the good protection of the rule of God is to be born again. And this illustrative picture language that Jesus is using is referring to a spiritual rebirth that we need. Recognizing that we are dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses. There's nothing that we can bring to the king for him to actually open up the gates and allow us in. Rather, we actually need to die so that we can be born again. But rather than dying physically ourselves, we see that Jesus took the price on himself. He was the one that died on the cross so that those who believe in him can now receive the new life. And so this is a spiritual rebirth. This is what we see happens in baptism, signi or signifying as one is dunked into the water. This is your old life dying in the earth. And as Jesus comes, the Spirit, we are resurrected into a newness of life. And we are invited to come and bow the knee to this kingdom and enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus, in fact, is the kingdom of God incarnate. 
Jesus is the actual kingdom of God coming into this earth, breaking forth, inviting others to become part of that kingdom. And yet, we are now faced with the question, if Jesus is the kingdom of God incarnate and he is also the king of that kingdom, how can we trust this king? And different from any other king or ruler that we've known in our life, we see that the rule of Jesus is not tyrannical. Jesus is the one that actually doesn't twist and use his authority and rule to simply serve himself, but actually come to save and seek the lost. In Matthew 11:30, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, family, the kingdom of God in Jesus is the realm of grace. This is the kingdom. And it's in this kingdom where the damage done by sin is repaired. When we pray for the kingdom of God to come, we pray for brokenness to be healed. We we pray for grace to be experienced. Thinking about the kingdom of God, it's got this future and present aspect to it. In terms of the future, when we pray, we look to the future for the forward to the perfecting display of God's grace when Christ ultimately returns. But we also look to the present now and we wish to see that God's display of sovereignty and grace would continue to grow and to expand in the minds and hearts of people because we realize that it's built on relationship right now with God. So when we pray, let your kingdom come, effectively we are also praying to our own hearts that his kingdom would come in my heart. Because his kingdom is caught up in Jesus, caught up in grace, we see that the idea of kingdom is fundamentally an idea of relationship. So praying to God that his kingdom would come It's actually much less about what would happen out there and much more what happens in my own heart. How is God's kingdom becoming more real and more of a reality in what I'm believing about Him? How are we allowing this image and idea of grace of Jesus expanding in my own heart, pushing out the idols that I have, pushing out the other mini saviors that Jesus Uh, that's replacing Jesus, even as Uli prayed, those things that we run to for comfort or to numb us against the pain or to give us some hope and security. As we're praying this, what we are really praying for is my heart to believe that Jesus is grace and good. We, We somehow make the prayer of God's kingdom come that he would come and solve all the other problems and not once thinking about the idea that I'm not yet fully trusting and believing that he is not just the true king, but a good king to be loved and praised. And so we pray for our own hearts that God would use supreme and yet as we pray let your kingdom come we have this intense desire to see the lordship of jesus also present in the people around us for those that don't yet know him this is why we want to be obedient to god this is why we actually want to live holy lives christians somehow get the wrong conception that we want to do things according to the will of God so that we can bring our good deeds to God almost as an offering or that we can bring it to the door so that we are allowed into church or so that people look at us and say, well, that's a good Christian or that we at long last have filled all the moral obligations or expectations that we've somehow put on ourselves or put on one another. No, the reason why we live different lives The reason why we want to continue to be more conformed to God is because what it communicates inwardly in my own kingdom. To which king am I listening? Which one am I obeying and bowing the knee to? 
the, the reason why sin matters, it's not because of trying to do the right thing, but it's communicating what I believe about the good king. This is why secret sin matters. There's, there's nothing like, nothing exists like a victimless crime. You guys heard the analogy, if you're alone on a road and there's a stop street, no one else is there, it's late at night, you can just drive through, it's a victimless crime. It's wrong, but there's no one there. There's no victim or someone that actually gets hurt in the process. We, we sometimes personalize that and think, the only things that I believe about God and that I'm struggling with in my heart that it's important is only when it affects the people around us not realizing that the issue of sin is actually not whether I'm doing the right or wrong thing, but rather what it communicates about the disposition of my heart towards the king. How much are we believing that his rule is not just in control and, and that he is the father but is good? How much am I allowing that to change me? This is why we are serious about the way that we live and act and do. This is why we want to hold one another accountable, not to be good Christians, but to help one another believe the good truth. That this is a good God that we can turn to. This is why we want to pray, come Holy Spirit. Come move among us. Come Bring us hearts that actually don't just know about you and want to live lives in accordance to that, but love or lives that love you. And so the question for the Christian becomes, are we seeing more of Jesus on the throne of my heart? And as we see that, and as we keep enjoying that, that then becomes the prayer and the mission for reaching the lost. Even as we think about missions, as we think about evangelizing those around us, we have to ask the question, what are we evangelizing people with? If we ask for God's kingdom to come, surely it's more than just getting people to be part of the Christians. Rather, we want to have this desire for people to also enjoy this good rule to also enjoy the goodness that we see. The reason why we are desperate for the lost to be found is because we recognize how ty tyrannical or how bad those false gods are. How they use you and yes, leave you around, uh, uh, on the side of the road, broken and battered. The reason why we want to reach the unreached nations is because they haven't heard that there's a new king, and this is a good king. This is why churches want to work together. This is why Christians want to send people out as missionaries. This is why I want to reach my neighbors, and why I am desperate for people to see not that I'm a good Christian, or what I'm, that my life is in order, but rather that I see, serve this good king. This is why we are urgent with these things. It's not to get them to be part of the club, it's to unmask these false idols that they're living for. Thinking that that will somehow bring you the fulfillment and the rest that your heart desires. When we pray, let your kingdom come, it is for our own hearts to believe it. It is a desire for others to see it. And then it is a call for others to go and share it. It is a self-commissioning when we pray that God's kingdom would come that he would use us to go and share this kingdom with the people around us. And that's why Jesus follows it up. We pray this, let your kingdom come, and Jesus' next line is then, let your will be done. Let your will be done. When we desire to see God's name hallowed, when we want the, to see the kingdom of God breakthrough in the hearts of men and women so that I may learn obedience, so that I may learn to submit and trust to the will of God. And here we then come to the essence and purpose of prayer. As J.I. Packer puts it, not to make God do my will, but to bring my will into line with His. We cannot sincerely pray for the God's kingdom to come and for his will to be done 
unless I deny myself, unless I'm putting God's agenda ahead of mine and believing that ultimately this is the best for me. And the perfect example of this, of where someone puts God's agenda ahead of his and where he knows this is the best thing, even though it means denying himself, is Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, the night before his crucifixion, very well knows what's lying ahead of him. It's not just the physical pain that he knows that he'll have to bear, but it's also the spiritual abandonment of his father as he carries the weight of the sin of the world. And so Jesus prays fervently in the God and making his desire known to God. If there's any other way, let this cup pass me by. Please, Lord. I'm not sure if I can go through this with this. Please, Lord, I'm not sure if this situation and the plan that you have is the best thing for me. Please, Lord, change the situation. Please, Lord, won't, won't, won't you get relief or, or bring down the evil ones? Won't you change the people's hearts? Save me from this situation, Lord. This is Jesus' earnest prayer. And yet, at the end of it, knowing what's coming, he says and he confesses, yet not my will be done but yours. Isn't it amazing this relationship that Jesus has with the Father? That knowing full well, and none of us will ever face a situation like this in our lives. No one will go through what Jesus went through. And so yet in the most dire situation that has ever been on earth, Jesus still submits to the will of the Father, making his request known, but then submitting to the will of the Father, knowing, knowing and trusting that God's will is not just supreme, but is the best thing in all reality to submit to. That God's will is ultimately better than my will. Family, and this is what it means for us. As we pray for God's kingdom to come, as we pray for his will to be done, ultimately it means for us to accept God's purpose for events. And this is a difficult one to deal with right now. Ultimately, as we pray for this, for his kingdom to come, and we pray for his will to be done, ultimately it means accepting and submitting the circumstances that I am right now. That God still has a purpose within that. Similar to Jesus, what we're not saying is that we never plead with God to change our situation, that we're never pleading with God to actually bring change in the hearts of men, that we never plead with God about our economic political and social situations of the country and knowing very well the dire situations that I am in right now, but knowing and understanding that he is still in control, that he does have a will and that he is trustworthy. That in prayer we can recognize that God is in fact in control. That he is good. And that somehow in this, the goodness of God will shine through. That even as I'm pleading with all these things, and yet I'm asking for his kingdom to come, that somehow my heart will be changed in the midst of it. So that today I will love and be closer to him than I was yesterday. I'm maybe not where I want to be. Maybe not yet there with my fight against sin and temptation and believing God. But God has moved me forward. By his grace and specifically in the way and the situations and the circumstances that he's put me in. And so it changes the way that we even see and view circumstances in our country. Never, never accepting injustice. Never accepting that things should just stay the same. We are agents of change after all. But having peace in the midst of it. Being secure in our identity and in the identity of our Father. And then we pray on earth as it is in heaven. Because that's our end goal. We want the kingdom of God to come 
so that we can experience this reality, like the reality of heaven, where we see the throne room of God, where we see ultimately all Christians going. That is the end goal. That's our end road. We will be with God. We will be in heaven. But why do we pray on earth as it is in heaven? <laughs> well, many of us, when we hear the words heaven, at least like we see it in the movies, they've got their own idea of what heaven is. And I'm not quite sure where they got the idea of the clouds and you jumping from cloud to cloud and just drinking your chocolate milkshakes and doing whatever you want to do. Heaven is basically just Disneyland for adults. It's um, your wildest fantasies, doing as much as you want, just what you want, every time and every day. And not to spoil your picture, heaven is going to be great, but it's not going to be that. Um, Listen to the illustrations or the analogies that the Bible uses when it talks about heaven. It talks about a banquet. That's why we eat a lot at Red Door. But it talks about enjoying a feast together. It talks about it being a wedding where we are the bride and Jesus is the bridegroom. And there's going to be this festival and there's going to be this celebration. It talks about it being a city meaning people are actually living close proximity with one another. It talks about heaven being a community and this diverse community of every tribe and nation and tongue. It talks about it being this congregational worshiping event where we see God and everyone then together worshiping and praising God. And so what we're seeing actually what heaven is and what it's about, it's about the perfecting of all relationships. And this is true even when we're not there. We see that the perfect relationship is within the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And perfect relationship with one another. And now inviting others into that. As we are perfected, now suddenly we have this perfect relationship with them. And we see that the relationship with one another is repaired. And even as we enjoy the perfect relationship with one another, we see that the relationship with us and creation is repaired in the city. And so, more than anything, we can talk about practically what it looked like and what we're going to do and where we're going to form and what we're going to do. But what heaven ultimately is about is about the perfective or the perfecting of relationships. And so, when we ask on earth as it is in heaven, what we are asking is for the repairing of relationships. Grace to be extended all the more in the brokenness that we're seeing in this world. What we are praying for is that this kingdom, we would taste more of that reality that we will ultimately one day enjoy full time. So I'm sorry, family. You've been added to this family now and forever. Even though we don't always want to spend time with one another, if you do want to taste a little bit of heaven, it's actually fixing what's going on right here. It's actually seeing how in miscommunications and in the brokenness of relationship, we can see how the gospel repairs relationships. If we pray for on earth as it is in heaven, we'll see that the gospel comes and it repairs family relationships. It repairs relationships between people that have experienced and grown up in racist and xenophobic environments, suddenly experiencing that there is something different. It re repairs relationships how we see different genders. It repairs relationships and how we see ourselves and our own individuality. It repairs relationships between us and even creation. And we are those agents of grace. And so the more we pray this, two things will ultimately start happening in our hearts. One, for us it should be an automatic praise point. Knowing that this has already been accomplished. God is already in these perfect relationships. And heaven already exists. And it has already been done and we are on our way there. And we can already start experiencing this and we can already give this to other people that we've been called into that relationship. But the second very important thing as we pray this 
for God's kingdom to come, his will to be done first in my heart on earth as it is in heaven. It gives us hope. That in the midst of a broken world, that this is not it. Whatever your situation is right now, and whatever you're faced with, that situation, or those voices, or those people, or your circumstance, won't have the final say about who you are and where you'll go. It is a reminder that we are on our way to spending eternity with the perfect God and the perfect relationship. It is an invitation to not lose hope and to become despondent in the things around us, even when we cannot see God's plan. Even though it is the darkest of times, to hold on the hope, and this is the hope and the seal that we have, Because Jesus not only died but was raised for us, we know that this kingdom is eternal. And so family, as we deal with difficult circumstances around us and deal with the fact that God is supreme, we pray this morning that you would see Jesus as a king worth submitting to and what that means in terms of pushing out our own idols and trusting in him. And seeing that more than then just getting your way and using God as the genie to suddenly change my circumstances to rather be changed in the middle of our circumstances. May that be true for us. May that be true for all Christians. And may we invite others into this. Amen. Father, this is what we want to see. This is what we want to give our lives to. We've seen the way that things go haywire when we try to build our own kingdom. We've seen how spectacularly we fail when we try to be king of our own lives. And yet, every day, we still buy the lie. And we still think about this weird way that if I'm just in control, I would be able to fix everything. And we're not even aware of the brokenness within ourselves and how deep that goes. And so, Jesus, what we pray this morning and what would we want to continue to pray every week is that your kingdom would first and foremost come in our own hearts, that we would come and taste and see that this king is in fact good. Father, ultimately what we're praying for us is that we would be people of joy and peace, seeing that this king invites us into this perfect relationship. Father, we pray that this way of thinking, even as Uli prayed this before, would counteract the poison of the idols of our lives that make us so discontent and depressed. Even though we are despondent about the world around us, even though we are depressed, and even though we are filled with anxiety, Father, I pray that in the midst of that, we would still be people of hope. Not unrealistic, but knowing that the heaven is more of a reality than this one because of the relationship that we have with you. We thank you that we can pray these things and ask these things because you are a good father. Amen.